Well, at one o'clock on the 20th of April, we officially open our meeting, noting the presence of 11 councillors with Councillor Harris on leave. We welcome members of staff, members of the public, together with those who are listening online. A reminder that mobile telephones should be switched off or to silent. Please be seated. In opening the meeting, the City of Launceston acknowledges Tasmania's Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of this land, and we pay respect to Elders past, present and future, as they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes for generations to come. We recognise and value Aboriginal histories, knowledge and lived experiences, and we commit to being culturally inclusive and respectful in our working relationships with our Aboriginal people. Item three on today's agenda. Are there any councillors wishing to declare any real or perceived conflicts of interest? Item four, confirmation of the minutes. The minutes from the council meeting held on the 6th of April. Someone to move. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie, and a seconder, Councillor Palmer. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. Item five, council workshops, 5.1 council workshop report from the workshops held on the 6th and the 13th of April. Moved Councillor Dawkins and seconded Councillor Britton. Councillor Dawkins, do you wish to speak to the motion? Only to say that it was another interesting suite um, in the workshop, but the QV Mag Futures paper is always really interesting for councillors and we're all very excited about the prospects and can't wait to see that implemented. Thanks, Councillor Dawkins. Seconder, Councillor Britton. Any councillor wishing to speak to the motion? Councillor Dawkins, anything further? We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. Item six, there are no councillors leave of absence requests. We move to item seven, community reports. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Scott Rigby, from the NTFA to provide us with an update and an overview. Scott, a big welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to come and speak regarding the NTFA. We're a big community organisation that has a geographical footprint of 25% of Tasmania. We work and play in seven local government and council areas, playing on 22 grounds. We're the only senior men and women's football competition in the north and northeast of the state. And we are the coming together of multiple competitions that unfortunately have gone by the by. We're made up of 20 clubs, 19 of those full member clubs, and the competition is governed by 12 independent member volunteer boards. The NTFA has a turnover in excess of about half a million dollars, and each club, depending on size and location, has a turnover of 150 to 350 clubs. Game day each week, the association comes into contact with between five and 6,000 people. Of the 20 clubs, there are roughly 600 volunteers that work and strive to make the clubs what they are and what the NTFA is. We have 2,150 registered players, nearly 400 of these being women, 147 coaches. They're coaching and playing across 60 teams, 13 of these being senior women teams and nine being under 18 junior, um, young men's teams, playing five men's and two senior women um, competitions. This year, there'll be 470 games played, including finals. Last year, our grand finals alone back at UTAS, and we thank very much for helping us get back on the best surface in the country. 10,000 people came and watched over those two days with 57,000 people watching the live stream of those games. They watched across the state, around the state, across the country, and quite a few overseas, which was very pleasing. On our social media side, we have over 10,000 followers, and we invest in promoting the game at our level, employing a media and marketing role for 16 hours a week. And this has made a huge difference over the last couple of years and helped us grow as an association, leading the state in what we do. We're based at UTAS Stadium. Within the AFL TAS's Northern Hub, working closely with the team there and our partners in the game, the NTJFA, the juniors, and the Northern Tasmanian Football Umpires Association. 
by our affiliation with AFL TAS, this enables us to use the office space of UTAS, as well as the support by their team, but also they employ a competition manager to help us manage our competition. There are three key factors that contribute to having sustainable clubs and an NTK competition, and they are people, inclusive of the participation of volunteers, finances and facilities, and we're very lucky to have what we have. But challenges currently exist, and we all know that. People with the numbers of participation and, and volunteers. And we're working hard with organisations and stakeholders to try and alleviate these pressures. Finances and the ability to generate income are also challenging, but we generally do it very well with improved governance structures. We also have pressure on facilities, and we have been seeing many improvements in this area, including lights, playing services and change rooms. We have a long way to go. And we appreciate what all councils do to support that. But some of those challenges are some of our clubs having older facilities, change rooms that do not meet contemporary standards, and particularly for female participants. Pressure on the limited number of grounds available for community football, particularly with current ground management strategies and our challenging weather conditions. We're struggling to fit all the games on when you include school and junior football. Often new facilities are built without planning, being aware of the AFL community football facilities guidelines, and as such, Whilst many may adequately cater for teams of 10, 11 to 12 participants or junior teams, they struggle with and are a tight fit for senior teams of 22 to 24 participants and trainer and trainer preparations. The NTFAC sport, our game, is pivotal in the continued development of our society, in particular our younger people, to engage in something worthwhile. We work with our clubs in creating pathways to enable sustainable outcomes both on and off the field. Our message and our obligation is not just about footy albeit our bread and butter, but it's about the community and us being the lifeblood of communities within our own. Footy clubs and sporting clubs are so important and are a building block, sharing and helping build and shape the people within it, giving them a sense of belonging and belonging to a community. We're very proud of our community participations in TFA and we partner with many community organisations around us to help and help share those messages. There's so important examples of these and and some examples of these are obviously speak up and say chatty with a mental health message. Last year we partnered with the Karina <coughs> and the whole competition stood together to stand up against domestic violence and deliver the home safe message. We'll be doing something very similar this year. It goes, we, we, many, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without our great many sponsors and one in particular we're very proud of is our local down the road and that is Bogues and the Lion. This is the longest running sponsorship of its kind in Tasmania. And our newest agreement will take us beyond 40 years. A massive amount of the sport. At the time of signing, it was the biggest agreement sponsorship of its kind out of Sydney horse racing, which was a big investment in the community footy. This is a small shot, snapshot, and I thank you all again for the opportunity to come along and speak on, the, on behalf of the NTFA. And I sincerely hope you can, and I invite you all to attend a game or two this year. Great. Thank you, Scott. I um, really want to thank you for the work that you do. Um, but that snapshot with all of those stats and I think that uh, those touch points in terms of the role that footy now plays, it's much more than, as you said, just a game. That sense of belonging and community development, um, more important than ever. To all the volunteers, um, incredible, you know, and we really thank you and your role as president for the work that you do, and if you could pass on to members of the board how appreciative we are. And I know the deputy certainly enjoyed being at the, the launch the other evening. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be great. Certainly can. Thank well, you. I did plan to have one, but unfortunately, the time being what it is. No, uh, that will be absolutely. wonderful. I might ask um, if, if you just email it through, that'd be great. Yep. Thanks so much, Scott. Item 8, public question time, 8.1, public questions on notice, 8.1.1 um, from Raphael of the Tamar Bicycle Users Group pertaining to cycling infrastructure, 8.1.2 from the Honourable Rosemary Armitage, MLC, with regard to the bypass feasibility study, 8.1.3, Samuel Butler, with regard to the intersection at Hobart and Hobart Road and Bladen Street, 8.1.4, Mr Ray Norman with regard to the QV MAG governance arrangements. 8.2, public questions without notice. Mr Baines, uh, I'll just invite, sorry, uh, Kelsey to provide the guidelines just for all speakers. I know you know them well, but just for the benefit of others. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, 
If you're participating in public question time, please move to the microphone at the rear of the council chambers and state your name and address. You may then ask up to three questions. Please direct your questions to the mayor. The mayor may refuse to accept a question. If this happens, reasons will be provided. If your questions are accepted, they will either be answered at this meeting or taken on notice and answered at a future council meeting. Debate or discussion about questions or answers is not permitted. Please note that only the questions asked at today's meeting without preamble will be published in the council minutes. Thank you, Kelsey. Welcome, Mr. Baines. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, um, it's, uh, it's it, no, it, we're coming through loud and clear for the recording. All right. Yeah. Oh, that's better. Now I can hear it. It's not marvellous when it works. Oh, at the May 22 council agenda, it mentions an improvement plan for the Princess Theatre and the Earl Arts Centre. At that time, this project was 2% complete. What is the state of progress now? Thanks, Mr Baines, for your question. Um, and out of respect for the level of detail that I think it warrants, we'll also provide uh, a more comprehensive answer on notice. But I'll ask the general manager responsible just to be able to provide a little snapshot today. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Thanks, Mr. Baines. Um, so the, the upgrade of the theatre and Hill Arts Centre, and that's a project that will that will be delivered over five, six, seven years, um, primarily because forward bookings can go out easily three years, so we have to schedule it in around their programs. Um, the the project that's in the annual plan that will run over the next eighteen months to do the design work um, and start getting all the permits. So it. it when we, at the time of that report, it only just, we'd only just kicked it off. Um, you'll see in the next uh, month or so, there'll actually be a tender out for architectural design for the theatre, um, at which I said it will run over the next 18 months, but the project itself will run over sort of five to seven years. It's around a $15 million upgrade of the, the facility. Thank you. And what we might do, Mr Baines, knowing your particular interest with regard to access at the Earl Arts Centre, will ensure that there's a paragraph included in our response that addresses that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the same agenda mentions the redevelopment of the former Birchwood building as being 25% complete, but what is the current percentage of completion? Uh, thanks for the question with regard to, to that development. We will take that on notice and provide a, a very comprehensive uh, understanding of where that project is at for you and our community. Thank you. Um, the April 2023 agenda describes procedures for demolition contractors on site, removal of rubbish, asbestos, etc. but no mention is made of the large quantities of reusable material. Given our circular economy movement and Council's own attempts at recycling, will Council insert a clause in the procedure B demolition between clauses B and C that suitable material be channeled to a recycle area or depot. Thanks, Mr. Baines, for that question. We'll take that on notice as well. But what I do want to say to you is that all councillors understand the significant issue that that form of waste is having and are very, very committed to ensuring that uh, a significant improvement is made with regard to the amount that is uh, being able to be diverted from landfill. So we will take that on notice and provide a comprehensive uh, answer. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Rosemary Armitage, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my question uh, comes from many constituents that I've been coming across of late, and the first one is the uh, if Mr. Mayor, if you or through the general manager, CEO, I should say, could provide the date or the dates at which council purchased the properties at 118 to 122 Brisbane Street, Launceston, and 124 Brisbane Street, Launceston, which are the Virtuals and the Cadiz buildings in the Launceston Mall, the purchase price of these properties, the current status of these properties, obviously they're empty, are they going to be leased, proposed to be leased, if empty, what's proposed for the premises, and what other property? With the exception, obviously, of council business sites, such as remount or, you know, council actual business sites, I'm talking about properties that wouldn't be considered normally by a council, which would be more purchased by a developer. 
Thank you, Rosemary, CEO, and we thank you for providing those in advance so that we could provide answers today, CEO. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rosemary. So, the council acquired the former Birchalls and Cadiz building in June of 2020 for $8.4 million. Um, the council advertised an expressions of interest process for the redevelopment of the building shortly afterwards. So, the, the council received 11 applications from developers that were interested in, in developing the site. After a detailed assessment of the various proposals submitted through the expressions of interest process, a preferred candidate has been shortlisted and the council is currently assessing the draft development proposal. This is expected to be finalised and considered by the council in the next few weeks. Uh, obviously, as you said, the, council, the building is currently vacant. So other than the, formal perma, the former Birchalls and Cadiz building, the council has not purchased any other sites and or buildings in recent times. This said, however, the council owns many buildings and it's not practical to provide the requested details for each of these at this time. But if there's a specific building for which the details are sought, we're certainly more than happy to oblige with that information. Thank you, CEO. Uh, thank you, Michael. Is it possible to get the answers in writing? Because sometimes it's hard to remember yep. at all. So if I could have an email, that thanks very much. My next question is another one received, actually, this one was received from a recent visitor to Tasmania, and he phoned me just recently to ask about graffiti. So it relates to uh, graffiti, and I can remember back in 2012, there was a graffiti task force which combined with TAS Police, the federal and state governments, to work on graffiti. So my question is, what is Council's current policy with relation to graffiti? Does it intend to bring back the graffiti task force? to assist local business as previously operated, or what action is being taken to discourage tagging and graffiti? And I do notice that the new Tatler Arcade already has graffiti sitting up there, which you know is quite sad and makes it look quite untidy. Thank you. CEO. Thanks again for the early advice. So um, I'll read this and provide it to you afterwards, Rosemary. So the City of Launceston has a zero, zero tolerance approach to graffiti and works with Tasmania Police and the local community and relevant agencies to support and generate activities that draw um, to, on social and environmental approaches to prevent, reduce and remove graffiti. Graffiti in the city is monitored by the Council's cleansing crew who perform various functions within the CBD on a daily basis. Any offensive graffiti is removed as soon as practical from council-owned facilities. However, we do not have the legal authority to remove tagging or graffiti from public or privately owned buildings. So across Launceston, there are some legalised graffiti walls um, in defined spaces, um, such as at the Royal Park Skate Park, which the council provides. There are also um, these, uh, sorry, there are also legalised murals and other forms of street art on many privately owned buildings, which add to the unique, you know, landscape, the streetscape of Launceston. So when graffiti is um, is is reported or, or noticed on private land, the council will um, write to the property owner. Um, we are we um, provide a, the following advice to them: so to remove or paint over the graf graffiti quickly. So research shows that removal within 24 to 48 hours deters further graffiti vandalism. Graffiti has a high cost to the community with social health and legal and economic implications. So in areas of high graffiti activity, it can impact on the perceptions and safety of the amenity. Um, preventing graffiti requires everyone in the community to be active and take ownership of the problem. The council has resources regarding graffiti specifically for our residents and businesses on our website. Um, and at this stage, it's not intended to investigate the establishment of a graffiti Task force. Rather, we would continue to engage with the community safety partnership, which um, has perhaps um, been more um, forward in, in dealing with this in recent times. Thanks, CEO. And I might add to that also educating and reminding our community of the opportunities for them to report, no matter how small the graffiti is, that through our customer service centre via an email or through Snap Send Soul, so that can be attended to as you heard the CEO say, either our own property removed or indeed then a letter written to uh, someone else to have it removed. Thank you, Mr Mayor. My final question is also from another constituent with regard to uh, or what is the current situation with regard to the Road Safety Centre at 45 to 67 Lawrence Vale Road, which I note is currently closed and not taking bookings. So if you could advise when it's likely to take bookings. Thank you. We like ending on a positive. CEO. Thanks, Rosemary. So 
So the council has reached the penultimate phase in the redevelopment of the uh, incredibly popular road safety centre, so the design of the interior fit out for the facility. So this will be occurring towards the end of this month. Um, so once that design work is complete, we, we expect to advertise a public tender in early June for the construction of the play space um, and the likely completion of the civic works of the car park that surround. Um, so the aim is to have the facility open to the public early next year. Thank you, CEO. Thank you, Rosemary. Are there any uh, additional questions from the public? Let's move to item nine of the agenda, page 17. Under the provisions of the Land Use Planning and Approvals Act of 1993, Council acts as a planning authority in regard to items included in agenda item nine, planning authority. I'll invite Kelsey to read the guidelines for those wishing to speak for or against a development application. Thank you, Kelsey. If you're speaking to an item on today's agenda, the Mayor will invite you to come forward to either microphone. Please state your name and address. You may speak for up to two minutes, either for or against the recommendation. You will hear this sound when you have reached your time limit. You may not ask questions or enter into debate with councillors or council officers. Your statement is not to be defamatory, inappropriate or abusive or be intended to embarrass any person. The Mayor may direct you to stop speaking if you do not follow these rules or if your statement repeats points that have already been made. Thank you so much. So I have no um, pre-registered speakers for item 9.1. That doesn't matter if there is someone who wishes to speak to 9.1. No. Seeking one of my colleagues to move 9.1. Moved Councillor McKenzie. This is 12 Olive Street, visitor accommodation, construction of alterations to an existing outbuilding for use as short term accommodation, noting it is retrospective and construction of a carport. Someone to second the motion. Councillor Kai, thank you. Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to speak? Thanks, Mayor. I stand to speak in support of the recommendation made by council officers. Um, this is, I guess, slightly unusual. It's a retrospective uh, application and I guess uh, probably just shows that when people buy property, they should actually check out to see whether things are authorised. But I think the uh, proponents uh, purchased the property thinking that they had a dwelling that they could utilise in the backyard and found that they couldn't. Um, they looked through the options on how to then regularise that, of which one was, I guess, going into... Uh, uh, semi-permanent accommodation in relation to rental uh, as opposed to short stay and I think the short stay methodology seemed to be a, a better path for them to go through in this case. I guess the major issues in relation to this are not so much objections to what's going on by the representors, there's more I think confusion to that process um, and receiving of information which had different addresses on it and timing of information and people being away. Uh, so I guess that out of that, the upshot is hopefully we'll do a reflection on how that worked and how we might be able to improve it going forward into the future. Uh, and I, get, I think the second one, which is actually related to the building activity, which is the Form 6, I think it is, that was lodged on the neighbours in relation to doing properties and needing to come onto their properties. So again, looking at how we might be able to explain better to residents who are impacted by developments, regardless of the fact this is only a planning issue, not the, not the building issue. Uh, but I think all of those things are just some good lessons for us to learn. But in light of the actual fact, there's a carport that's looking to be built. Uh, we viewed the site. The site's got eminent room to be able to build a carport and actually house enough ha enough cars in relation to both that site and the and the main dwelling on the property. So uh, the discretions that are being uh, being asked for are minor. Uh, the issue is simply, and I guess because it's short term accommodation, it sparks a bit of interest in the community given the nature of the conversations that have been going on in relation to that. But in this instance, I think it's a very uh, sensible recommendation that's been made by officers. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Seconder, Councillor Kai. Good at this moment. Any other councillors wishing to speak to 9.1? Councillor Walker has a question. Yeah, and I certainly support the mover in, in his uh, comments. And um, But my question... Um, is it does go to that confusion that was mentioned, um, apart from the, um, the people being away and things like that. There seems to have been some confusion over uh, notifications, but um, also the the documents that were available for people to to 
observe uh, from what I've read. They could come and see the plans, which is what they could see online anyway, but there was no further supporting documentation. Is that a normal uh, situation as far as advertised plans go? Thank you, Councillor Walker. Manager of Planning, Richard. Um, <clears throat> generally speaking, all the well-earned documents are placed on the internet. Uh, there are some procedural documents and other things that may be in the file. The file is available for inspection should people want to inspect the file. Um, normally, the internet suffices. Manager planning, I think more over, was there enough information for oh, the public provided? Was there enough to understand what the development was? Yes. Thank you. Anything... In addition to that, would be of a minor and procedural nature. Thank you so much. Councillor Walker, any further questions? Wish to speak? Thank you. Councillor Thank you. Walker. Yes, I will speak. Um, and look, I can understand the um, you know, consternation that people in the immediate area, representors, might have in this situation. Um, it, 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 I mean, if someone goes away, hopefully someone's checking your mail, and that shouldn't be a problem, perhaps. But, um, you know, we, I agree when it comes to. Uh, any developer can apply to have and, and has the right to have access to your property, uh, which could sometimes be, you know, rubbing salt into someone's wounds if they're not particularly happy with the development. So I agree uh, with the mover of this motion that um, anything we can do to, uh, to make that uh, more apparent up front, to make it clear that this is always a possibility for any development that um, may require that access. Um, but also, yeah... It just seems that there's been quite a bit of confusion all around. The representors aren't necessarily against the development per se. It just seems to be a lack of understanding as to what the implications might be. Um, I think in this case, the implications won't be great. Uh, the, the building footprint stays the same. Um, some some uh, you know, addition is made to the, to the wall at the back to make it uh, compliant. But beyond that, uh, the use um, hopefully uh, is, is not something that's going to have a major impact on anyone, traffic-wise or otherwise. So I will be supporting it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Any other speakers to 9.1? Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to close? We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. 9.2, page 26 of the agenda, DA 0053, 2023, 315 to 317 St Leonard's Road, Business and Professional Services, construction and use of a new building for a funeral parlour. The first speaker I have listed is Phil Lethborg. Would you like to come to the microphone? Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, I just want to say we appreciate the council planner's recommendation for approval of our uh, development. We believe our use is probably the most congruent uh, use of the property that has served the local community for many years. Many former parishioners, neighbours and relatives of those interred in the existing cemetery were very concerned uh, when the property was sold by the Anglican Church. Many of these people have contacted us expressing their relief and support that the property will continue to operate in a very similar fashion as before and uh, will be kept and maintained well. Neighbours have called expressing their uh, support also. Even the two representations uh, were not opposed to the use or the development, uh, just wanted clarification on cemetery perimeters and wall maintenance, which we believe we've uh, eased their concerns. Uh, we believe it makes sense to approve uh, this considered site-sensitive development and use. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. I have no other speakers listed. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to 9.2? No? Someone to move the motion. Moved, Councillor McKenzie. Seconder. Councillor Pentridge, you are excused. Councillor Pentridge withdrawing at 129. A seconder for the motion. Deputy Mayor, thank you. Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to speak to the item? I do, and thank you. I rise again to support the recommendation made by the officers and 
I have had discussions with proponent about this proposal uh, some months ago, uh, and there was a bit of concern in relation to how that would go forward because it's actually not an approved use under the planning scheme, but it's terrific that we've managed to find a pathway through, uh, through the heritage uh, provisions, which is unusual if it's actually working for a direction, which is terrific. So, uh, that's not, that's not well said, but uh, the, 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 the heritage provisions are actually used to make something go forward in another direction, I think is fantastic. Uh, and it's great that they've worked with uh, council and uh, the neighbours in relation to how this is going to un unfold. Uh, as stated by the speaker, uh, most of the questions in relation to the matter are actually just about what's going to happen to the cemetery and, and I guess clarifying whether it's going to have future burials be allowed in there, but it's only the pre-existing bookings that are allowed to go in there. And the other one is the columbi columbarium, uh, the wall, uh, and making certain that that is maintained and looked after in relation to uh, uh, the loved ones that are actually uh, stored and interned in that in that, in that wall. So uh, I think that this is a great outcome for all around because it means that the heritage of the church is maintained. It gets another another life in relation to the uh, to the uh, the funeral parlour, but also enables that church to continue on to operate uh, at, at different times. So I think it's a really good outcome for the community, and I fully support it. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Pentridge, returning at one thirty one. Deputy Mayor, do you wish to speak to the motion? Thank you, Mayor. Just briefly, I think that this is a great example as the Leftworks were able to say that they were able to, whilst they had representations, they were able to speak to those representatives to put their minds at ease and that this is a reflection of how you can still have some doubts or some concerns, but there is a way to mediate and a way to converse through a time where you might see some issues and I'm sure that the Leftworks are not going to be having thousands of people into that little venue as to some of the representatives might have been worried about that their integrity and their professionalism, they're very aware of what they're doing and it's a good example of, of that reflecting into the community. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any additional speakers to 9.2? Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to close? We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. 9.3 refers to DA 0695-2022, 167-171 to Invermay Road, Invermay, bulky goods sales, demolition of existing buildings, construction of a building for use as a showroom with two tenancies, an associated car park and signage, including illuminated signs. I'm on page 35 of the agenda, and I welcome the first speaker listed, Matt Clark. Welcome. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillors, uh, my name is Matt Clark. I'm from JMG at uh, 49 and 51 Elizabeth Street. Uh, the current uh, proposal uh, on this one is uh, on a site zoned uh, local business, uh, and it's currently used for bulky goods as a use. So uh, the application, there is no change of use in this case. There are businesses located uh, both north and south of the site, so it's in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area, as you would know, uh, and to the rear of the site, there's some, uh, there's some, there is some housing uh, for, uh, for government housing purposes. Now, the tenant proposed for the site is Ashley Furniture, uh, and uh, they will be the tenant facing, facing the street. There is a, another tenancy that hasn't been uh, filled yet. Uh, deliveries to the site are not uh, particularly regular, as you'd probably expect with a, a furniture showroom. Uh, there, there was a, a, a bit of discussion with the council engineers around getting trucks in and out of the site and the conditions set up and arranged whereby the large and medium rigid trucks can go in and, and out in a forward direction, uh, but that's outside the operating hours, hours of the building so that that doesn't cause um, problems on Invermay Road itself. So that's, um, that's a good thing and we certainly support that. Uh, we think that the outcome that we've uh, put forward here is a, uh, a good one in that uh, uh, we've chosen to put the building up against the street um, and that uh, we haven't uh, addressed the street with car parking, as is, is, is often the case with these types of developments. So I think we think we're really going to reinforce the activity centre there and provide some, some street, street um, activity. So we think that's a good thing. In terms of the um, representations that have been made, we understand that there's a, always a bit of anxiety with a new uh, commercial 
premises going into into an existing area from from surrounding businesses. So we understand that. Uh, but uh, it, 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 this is not a big box development in that sense. Um, the, the parking has been assessed by uh, both our own traffic engineer and uh, um, council's engineers, and that's found to be adequate. Thank you, and I'll ask you to wind up there. Okay, thanks. And the final thing was in terms of the flooding, we'll, uh, we'll have in place, um, that'll be dealt with through the floor, uh, um, floor levelling and uh, flooded um, emergency management plan, which is fairly common for Great. us to decide. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any additional speakers for 9.3? Someone to move the item, Councillor McKenzie, three of three. Someone to second, Councillor Dawkins. Thank you. Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to speak to the item? If I could, but just be prior to that, I just might just ask a couple of questions. I was just wondering if the officer could just speak to the flood mitigation issues in relation to buildings on the floodplain. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. Um, town plan, planner delete. No, Manager Richard. Team effort. Thank you. Um, so, in common with all the uh, developments within um, the Inverray Inverask area, it's assessed against a specific code in the planning scheme. It's also importantly referred to the flood authority for comment. So um, this application um, has the support of the flood authority. They've assessed the, uh, the impacts on the flood and deemed that to be acceptable. Um, the application was made in, with, it, with the support of a technical report on how this would be resilient to the flood, which talks about building resilience. It talks about location of electrics and other things at a higher level, emergency management plans and other things. So we're pretty confident that, that this is an appropriate um, use in the, uh, in the flood zone. It's a relatively low capital intensive use. It's not a residential use. It's not gonna put people in harm. Um, and it can be managed in the, um, in the event that it floods. Thank you, Richard. Dilip, is there anything further you'd like to add or are you happy? Yep, thank you. Councillor McKenzie, further question? No, 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 I'll speak now. You'll thank speak you. as the mover. Thank, thank you. Th th thank, thank you for that. I, I just felt it was worth doing. I mean, this is a conversation we have every time we do something in Invermay, uh, and it's a development. We have traffic management and we have uh, flood issues that are dealt with. Um, we regularly get back a traffic management plan that says this works. Uh, I'm not a traffic management person, and I can understand with the confluence of Bryan Street on the other side of the road, uh, and the level of traffic that go up and down Invermay Road, anybody who lives or works or drives by or walks by there will be concerned about the impact on traffic in relation to it. I think the heavy reticulated vehicle issue which was raised uh, and being dealt with on the fact that there have been, I think, some uh, manoeuvring changes in, in, in the site to enable vehicles to go in forward and come out forward, I think are a really good thing. And I think the second thing are the restrictions of only being able to work outside of 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, means that the vehicles are going to be moving in and out at a less uh, traffic generated time. So I think that that all works. Uh, parking, another one which is always a big thing, have we got enough parking spots on the site, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's, it's a regular occurrence in our conversations. All I can say to that is that, as explained by the officer in relation to the flood management thing, we actually have a plan and how we do that and where services need to be uh, built within the buildings to ensure that if a flood does come, uh, that the properties are able to deal with those. And given that we get at least three days warning in relation to any floods that are gonna happen, all of the buildings and, and commercial premises on the Inverest floodplain get well and truly aware, aware, made aware of that. Uh, and they've all got plans on how to exit safely and so forth like that. So therefore, we're much happier with commercial properties and commercial buildings as opposed to residential because it's a lot harder for us, us to manage that actual aspect of it. So I'm comfortable that we meet it. It's been through the flood authority. So therefore, yes, we're built on a floodplain. Um, that's what the levee walls are there to try and protect and make sure at least we've got an adequate warning system in relation to it. Uh, but does it mean we don't build anything on it? The answer is no, we don't because we've been building on it for over a century. Uh, so we continue to do it and we just managed to come up with mitigation measures in which to do that. So I accept the officer's responsibilities and we've uh, the responses and note that we've actually got lots of flood mitigation plans within the planning scheme to deal with these issues. In relation to the traffic management, there's been a traffic management study done. Um, it's been approved by our, our traffic works people and there's been one outside that. So the reality of it is 
I'm not skilled to be able to say, yes, I know there will be more traffic potentially that will come onto the road. Uh, our road authority is telling us there is sufficient capacity to deal with that. Uh, yes, there will be some inconvenience from time to time. I think another issue is that we've got car yards that are emptying up down the road. Why don't we do it down there? Um, it's a commercial property owned by a person. Uh, they should have the right to build on a commercial a, a, a property that's zoned to have commercial property. Uh, therefore, they've made the choice to build it there, not down the road, because they probably don't own that property. So I uh, respect the value, uh, the fact that somebody who actually owns a property has a right to use the property in a manner for which it is zoned, and therefore uh, I'll be supporting this application today. Thank you, Councillor Mackenzie. Seconder, Councillor Dawkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to add a few additional words, uh, it's clear to us um, that ribbon development on places like Infamay Road is not without its challenges for residents. It always has been, and I assume it always will be. Um, during the building phase and then again during the operational phase, two completely different stages that um, res residents have to manage and, and, and that I think we manage relatively well. Um, the, the conditions that have been applied will go some way to assist there, but it's yeah, certainly a time uh, for residents where they have to live with a certain amount of upheaval. Um, I was particularly interested in the representative for Dr. Koshin's information around sponge cities, and I'd like to do some further research around how that applies to a floodplain, because it seemed to me the example given was not on a floodplain, because of course a floodplain can't absorb an infinite amount of water because it's not only coming potentially from the sky, potentially over the levees, but also from underneath as well. And that's a completely different set of circumstances. So I think it would be really interesting to do more reading on that, but I, I really appreciate the representations and, and further study. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dawkins. Anyone else wishing to speak to 9.3? A question, Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mayor, through you, if I could, that, um, that does, you know, require that discretion as far as parking goes. There's something around 45 car parks would be uh, normally associated with a development that size and something like 22 being provided. Um, is that based on the floor size of the, um, the warehouse in question? Thanks, Councillor Walker. Manager of Planning, Richard, is that something you're able to answer? Um, the, the planning scheme works on a, uh, a relatively conservative standard allowance that works on floor area. Um, that's a, in our context, it generally overstates the requirement. It's a conservative figure. Um, when the use is analysed by traffic engineers um, and the actual characteristics of the use, not the generic kind of big box type use that you see all over. Um, quite often that is brought down to a level that's more manageable. And it's certainly my experience that in Launceston that there's a lot of furniture shops with half empty car parks for that reason. So um, in terms of the Invermay, the village of Invermay, certainly minimizing the land, the flat tarmac areas um, it's probably better for the streetscape. It's probably better for the commercial uh, feeling of that village. So certainly, um, aligning the amount of car parks to the reasonable use is a better outcome than sticking to a formula that may not be appropriate. Thanks, Richard. Councillor Walker, any further questions? Yes, if I may. Thank sure, you, sure. Mayor. Um, then. Was there any discussion had about making the floor size smaller, therefore either reducing the amount of car parks required or indeed increasing the amount of car parks available? Or was that not a discussion that was ever had? Manager planning. I think our, um, the, the application was made and assessed to be okay. I don't think there was any necessity to do that. Thank you. Councillor Walker. I'd like to speak to the motion, if I may. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Councillor Dawkins has spoken. That's fine. Yes, oh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Now, you can see, obviously, I do have that concern. It's partly because of the um, the way that this will connect to Invermay Road, um, on adjacent to that um, intersection with, as I'm looking at it, Bryan Street. Um, it is already, you know, uh, 
increasingly difficult, I suppose, to get onto into the main road if you're turning against the flow of traffic, uh, something that will probably continue to get worse just because the road would, over the years, seem to be getting busier and busier. This will certainly contribute to that. And I can imagine, I can well imagine, people who are going to this destination uh, wanting to turn against the flow of traffic when they come out of that site. Uh, rather than head north, if they have come from the south, they'll want to head back south. That's just the nature of uh, our people. So what we're doing is contributing uh, to the difficulties in that stream. Now, I'm not saying that that's impossible to, to manage or anything like that, but I do have my concerns when um, you, you, um, you know, sort of couple that with it being adjacent to a, you know, another another street in Invermay. Um, and I do, you know, also have those concerns if, now, yeah, you know, I can well accept that the car park may never be full. That's true, but um, it almost, it, it, it also may be the case that trucks uh, will uh, arrive at different times of the day for different reasons. There's nothing to stipulate that trucks have to come at a certain time of day, even though I'm sure that's how it'll be managed as best as possible. Um, essentially, what I'm saying is there's a lot of question marks around that. And I can see that how that could contribute um, to people's concern. Uh, when it comes to the flood mitigation, I have not ever been uh, overtly supportive of new developments on a floodplain. Uh, that includes universities, um, it includes warehouses, and certainly the council does have policy as far as uh, people's living um, arrangements go. But when it comes to these type of developments, uh, we seem to think that uh, that is not a necessary consideration, that the contribute, uh, contribution that this would make to worsening a flood event is not worthy of consideration as far as uh, a development proposal goes. So, having said all that, you know, a building that was above the floodplain that maybe had, um, you know, residential space above it, that would be something that wouldn't contribute to the flood problem, um, but a building that is on the ground floor um, potentially can contribute. It's arguable whether it contributes a lot or not. Um, so, yeah, I, um, I, I struggle with this decision because I can see uh, the benefit of utilising the site. I'm not against the concept in itself. Um, I certainly would like to have seen more provision for car parking or perhaps more consideration uh, given to where uh, the ingress and egress um, is on the site. Um, as it turns out, it will be on an intersection and, uh, yeah, that's a little problematic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Any other councillors wishing to speak to the item? Yeah. No further questions. Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to close? Yeah, I do, thank you. Just to respond to a couple of things that Councillor Walker raised, that the heavy rigid vehicles are actually limited between seven p.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning. They can't do it during the day, so therefore that's part of the conditions of that. So therefore those heavy vehicles won't be going in and out of the site during the day, well, basically during the daylight hours uh, outside of uh, uh, daylight savings. Um, and I guess the flooding was considered, as each of them are by the flood authority and was approved uh, for the use uh, by them. So they, I guess, view these things and take into account the matters pursuant to the, the planning scheme and in relation to how the flooding mitigation issues arise on the uh, on the floodplain. And I think the other thing which was relation to traffic, which is something I did neglect to talk about earlier, there are a set of traffic lights which I think are only about 50 metres down the road. I think one of the representatives actually expressed that that would be a detriment uh, to the whole thing because of the queuing that goes on there. In my view, it actually allows people to escape out of Bryan Street in both directions uh, when the traffic lights are red and likewise egressing in and out of that that property, I think, will be assisted by the traffic lights. So I think that's a further mitigation uh, aspect in relation to this development application. So again, I'll, uh, uh, I'll restate the fact that I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those councillors in favour raise their hand. Those councillors against? There's one councillor against in Councillor Walker. The other 10 are four. Therefore, the motion is carried 10-1. Thank you. Council no longer sits as a planning authority. 
Let's move to item 10, announcements by the Mayor, page 48 of the agenda. The first thing I'd like to note is to um, make a change there that Councillor Dawkins represented Council uh, attending Brick exhibition on Sunday the 16th of April. Appreciated. I'd further like to pick up on the item on Friday the 14th of April, the meet and greet barbecue. Uh, with representatives and members of our Tasmanian Aboriginal community, the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre. As um, our council knows, recently we endorsed our first ever Aboriginal Partnership Agreement, a wonderful beginning as we set to reframe our relationship with our Tasmanian Aboriginal community. And it was just wonderful that we could um, afford uh, the opportunity to converse in a very traditional way over a good old barbie with members of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community at the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre. I think it would be fair to say, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the words of Lisa Colson, the manager, she herself was overwhelmed with the number of community members that stayed around and wanted to attend the barbecue. Uh, it sets a great message for what could be an ongoing a way of us just building a relationship uh, with our community members. And I want to thank those councillors who made it their um, business to be there. There was a great number of councillors who could be there, a couple who we knew or apologies, but I think it was a great way of us setting our relationship with the TAC in motion. Uh, and I want to thank Lisa Granger from our staff who facilitated and afforded us that opportunity. Further, and finally, I want to recognise that this morning a number of councillors had the opportunity to visit the Tramways Museum, and I note that a couple had previously visited, together with staff, CEO, some staff who attended. It was just great for us to realise the passion and the work of that volunteer group who are doing such a wonderful job there to preserve our history uh, and to look after the building uh, of which we own. Uh, so well. Obviously, lots of plans. Community groups always have plans for the future. That's what fuels, um, you know, progress. So we look forward to considering their plans into the future. But I want to thank those councillors who gave up their time to be present this morning. And importantly, I want to recognise the Tramway Museum for their um, passion, their advocacy and their great work. Are there any questions with regard to the Mayor's announcements? You may. Councillor Kai retiring at 1.52. Councillor's reports. Councillor McKenzie. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, commentary in relation to Brick Exhibition. I didn't attend officially, but I attended with my grandchildren uh, on the Saturday. And I have to say, what a marvellous thing for Launceston. And the amount of effort that goes into putting those displays together was terrific. And just to show you how far that reaches out into the community, uh, the Northern Suburbs Community Centre has got their own little Lego club and they've had Lego donated and one of our members of our Lego club actually put in uh, a, uh, an exhibition into the, into, the, into, the, uh, into the whole thing and it was just fantastic and uh, the joy when I was up at the uh, Northern Suburbs Community Meeting on Monday about our contribution towards Brick Exhibition was fantastic. So I think little could be said to say other than what a wonderful thing that it is. And I just did want to add, and I go back and I see uh, the magnificent uh, town hall and this whole square emulated in some Lego. And uh, I'll go back to what I said a number of years ago in the activation of uh, the city and the mall. I think it would be fantastic if, if we managed to purloin that uh, bit of sculpture and actually put it in a glass case in the middle of the mall. And I think you'll find that will attract people in there time and time again. I just think it's fantastic. And it's something you can continue to build on. As things change, they can go in and put some new bits of Lego in there. But I think it would be a wonderful thing that it would bring children and big children like me uh, along to look at it time and time again. So anyway, I think fantastic. And congratulations to the organisers. I mean, it was just absolutely packed. And they're donating to a very worthwhile purpose. Their, uh, their funds from, from the day. Indeed, Councillor McKenzie, and of course, um, uh, something that's grown over time with the support of our small grants, and I'm sure the yeah. general manager responsible for activation has jotted that idea down. Any other additional uh, councillor reports? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on Easter Saturday, it was my privilege to represent yourself and the City of Launceston at the Families and Children's Festival at Riverbend Park. After torrential rain the day before, the sun was absolutely shining on an incredibly well-attended event. It was free. 
Uh, the food was free, activities were free, and it was just a general well-being feeling event in an activated and engaged spot that's owned by council. And Dr. Raze was there with his dancing shoes. So it was great. It was really, really good to see how we can activate a council-owned space and how well and how well attended our, our community engages. Great. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any other councillor reports? Item 12, questions by councillors, particularly questions on notice. 12.1, uh, Councillor Harris's question with regard to bicycle parking and storage for football games at the University of Tasmania Stadium. 12.1.2, Councillor Kai's question with regard to community bake days and the infrastructure associated with that. 12.2, councillors questions without notice. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And through you, if I may direct this to General Manager Ryan. So firstly, though, I'd like to thank the communications team for what they've done with their social media campaigns, particularly in the lead up to this weekend's game of AFL at Utah Stadium, which is the Hawks versus the Crows. So if I may ask, learning from the last game and to protect the businesses and residents of Invermay, what have we as a city of Launceston implemented or what do we plan on implementing on the game day and the lead up to the game to facilitate those with any parking issues? Great. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. We welcome Councillor Kai back at 1.56 and General Manager Dan. Thank you for the question, Deputy Mayor. So there's a few things we've got um, we've had underway in terms of preparation for the next AFL game. So you will see some virtual message, message boards and also some static signage, particularly with a focus around the levee area and the grassed area at the half um, circle car park. Those um, signs will be highlighting the preferred use, well, the use and the free parking available through the northern ingress car park. Um, our comms team have been great actually. They've incorporated some QR codes for those people who are unfamiliar with the area they can scan the QR code, which will direct them to where the northern car park is um, to help those people who are unfamiliar with what, um, how to best find the way to the, to the free car parking. Um, we've also been, you may have seen this, pushing pretty hard through our social media channels, a campaign just reminding people that there is free parking at the Ingress car park. Um, clearly, we're all looking for the same outcome is that we get that car park full and that um, the infrastructure is protected um, on game day. And some additional radio advertising, I believe, as well. Correct. Yeah. Right. Deputy Mayor. Whilst you're there, General Manager, if it's okay through you, Mayor. Uh, we've, we've heard questions today about the graffiti. We're hearing about cleansing crews and things, but if there are people that want to be involved in expressing themselves artistically, what would you recommend they do to reach out if this is something that they're interested in and they want to actually find out more about how they can be involved in the art space, having unanimously move forward with our arts cultural programs? Yeah, it's another good question. So we've got a fair bit happening in the public art space at the moment as a platform to help, I guess, harness some of that creativity around the community. Mm -hmm. So there's a few projects that, the, um, that our officer is working on with our cultural advisory, advisory committee, one of which is reviewing a street art lane. Um, there obviously is the identification of some key sites across the city, whether it be council owned or privately owned sites that we could utilize for public art. Um, and as soon as those programs are ready, we, we just need to connect with the community to advise them on how to connect and how they can participate in those programs. Um, the best initial step for someone who wanted to make contact now would be through our customer service centre um, and us to speak to our cultural um, advisory officer. That's wonderful. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, any further questions? Councillor McKenzie. Thanks. Mine was similar. That actually in regards to the public art policy, just to sort of fully, more fully answer where uh, Honourable Rosemary Armitage asked the question is that our public art policy is actually a part of a diversion policy in relation to graffiti as well. Is that, is that not correct? <clears throat> Absolutely. All the best research suggests if you get some good public art mm -hmm. um, up on walls across the city, the likelihood of that getting um, tagged becomes significantly um, decreased. So there's, that's part of the philosophy behind this project is to get um, yeah, local art up on our, our walls. Thank you. Which is graffiti. Yeah, fantastic. And my second question was really just in relation to a um, constituent rang the other day. I don't know if it's necessarily you, uh, Dan, but uh, in relation to fees and charges and how we pay, uh, I think they came and tried to pay something over the telephone and had difficulty and just the flexibility of being able to be pay or being able to pay directly into the account instead of we've got to pay it by credit card, then we're you know, charging 
percent of charges whereby I just want to pay it directly into the council. So just looking at the flexibility of our payment structures, they thought would be a really good way of them being able to pay us without us actually being charged an extra one or two percent by credit card charges. So just looking at the flexibility, is that something that we could do? Let's take that a notice. We'll provide a comprehensive yeah. um, response to that. Great. Thank you. Any further councillors' questions? Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a question in regard, and it is also adjacent to the uh, questions that are being asked. Interestingly enough, the removal of the thylacines has been decided. Could we get a timeline uh, roughly for that, and also the process that will be involved in terms of where the locations for them will be uh, in Civic Square? Thanks, Councillor Walker. General Manager Dan. Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, thylacines are due to come out of the mall next week. So there's been some preliminary work done this week and last week just to make sure that process is um, is relatively seamless. Um, in terms of the placement, our placemaking team is currently working with the artist, the, the sculptor, to make sure we have the right placement through Civic Square, finding the suitable locations. You may recall there was a few that have been potential locations that are highlighted as part of a previous presentation. Some of those are, are very likely to proceed. We're just fine-tuning some of the other sites. Great. Thank you, Dan. Councillor Walker. Happy? Any further questions without notice? There being none, let's move to item 13, Organisational Services Network 13.1, the 2022-23 budget, budget amendments. We welcome Manager of Finance, Nathan and um, Roxanne, our um, Acting Organisational Services Network, GM. Someone to move the item. Councillor Britton, thank you. A seconder? Councillor McMahon, thank you. Councillor Britton, do you wish to speak to the item? Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Initially, I thought I was seconding it, but that is OK. <laughs> um, no, I had a quick look over everything last night. Uh, it, um, looks above board you do good work and thank you thank you very much i'll be voting in support thank you thank you seconder councillor mcmahon <laughs> does any councillor wish to speak to the item councillor walker thank you mayor i will speak to uh one um uh project number being um two double four double two the tensing park public open space which is in st leonard's um as a member of the um uh, the Tender Review Committee, this is something that was um, recently discussed and you'll note that an extra $60,000 has been allocated um, to that project. I suppose that's typical of the, the small adjustments that are made as the, years go, as the year goes on um, and people are free to have a look through there and, and see uh, revised budgets as, um, as these things progress. And um, so it's just an opportunity, uh, I suppose, for the public as well as for councillors to keep an eye on uh, what has been happening um, in, in, within council as um, these various projects come to their fruition. Um, and I heartily recommend the um, uh, item for approval. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Any other contributions? Yes, Councillor Kai, a question. Um, uh, OP22869, the Heritage Advisory, um, it's got, I'm a little bit confused, so current approved amount is 20,000, transfer from 10,000, so does that mean the new budget is only 10,000 for the year? That's right. Um, if we're starting off with a $20,000 budget and we've transferred 10 off, then there's $10,000 remaining. Can yes. I ask why? It what page was that one on? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Councillor, what page was that on? Page 55. Uh, table 1B. Uh, look, I'll need to take that on notice and have a chat to the officer that, that put that one through and come yeah. back to you if that's okay. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Just that, um, because I'm only new on the uh, uh, heritage advisory, so um, we've always we just had a meeting yesterday, and um, 
I was told the budget is 20,000 and we're working on ways of incentives and things like that. At the moment, there's the SNAP, is it called Snapchat, which, uh, uh, which we give out uh, awards. And then there, there's the other, um, what was the other one? Where they had people can apply for uh, competitions and things like that. So if this budget gets cut down to 10,000, um, we, we won't be able to hold many competitions and things like that. General Manager Dan. Thank you for the question, Councillor Kai. So, as you may note, some of those trims were made to accommodate some of the um, new trail, the tracking systems for the bandits that have been located throughout the city, which have got some really good benefits for community as well. But the, um, through discussions with the officers, there's still sufficient funds for us to accommodate the, the Heritage SNAP program um, and additional programs uh, as part of that $10,000 um, funds that are remaining. Um, it's just that um, I, I do, like, I, I realise um, the other competition hasn't been very popular for the last year or so, but we were thinking of other ways of bringing something similar back. So if the budget's cut down to 10000 um, pretty much uh, with, with our meetings so that we've agreed to have it at the Macquarie House rather than up here because of hearing problems with the uh, members, um, that there's going to be extra spending, like extra money is going to be needed. So it's you've passed the budget. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, great points that you're making. Important to note, and the CEO is just um, reminding me of this. This is for this financial year, whereas I think you might be referring to next financial year. So we're not changing the budget for next financial year. That's still proposed to be twenty thousand dollars for next year. For next year, so. Because Heritage Snap is held after July one. After July, so so with the halving the uh, the allowance for the Heritage Advisory Committee, like when does that start, or, or for what time period? I'm so sorry. that will um, run until the thirtieth of June is what we're looking at here. So um, what I would say, and, and further to Dan's comments, um, there's funding available in this financial year to the end of June, from July one to the end of. 30 June um, the following year, we're still proposing to have that same amount, but so you're advising next year you're it will still be 20000 That's correct. Right, okay, sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, no, that's good. They'll never not put it up without a descriptor again. <laughs> Councillor McKenzie. Yeah. Just, just to follow on from that, we've already done what we were doing for Heritage in this year and we won't have spent the 20000 so it's basically what's left over, which can be transferred, I think, is how that's working. And next year, you'll get your 20000 back again to yeah. use. I understand was because we haven't been spending it. Yeah. I thought you're now just taking it off. So then, That's good. from the future, also, we're only going to get ten. Thank from you. Now. No, I thank understand. you for clearing yeah. that up. No worries. Any further questions, Councillor Kai? No, no. Councillor McKenzie. Sorry, so just for clarity, th these are just adjustments in the budget. We're running into 30th of June. Uh, the budgets that have been impacted are wobbly budgets that have got excess amounts sitting in them, and therefore they say, okay, because we need somewhere else, we'll move it to somewhere else. So that's how this happens, and I think the descriptors are there to explain why it's being done. Um, so they're, you know, in my experience, they haven't moved money out of budgets which don't have money left to spend. They only move it out of budgets that have actually got money left over. So it's really about a timing issue in that particular instance. But I think that you know the other part of this is that sometimes we go out and we think a project is going to be uh, an operational factor, and then uh, our auditors or our, our staff members will look at the project and determine that it's actually capital. So we've taken it out of an operations budget, and it actually should have come out of the capital budget. So we need to swing it round, which means our capital expenditure goes up and our operation expenditure goes down, or, or vice versa. And this is what these these adjustments are all about. But clearly, you know, understand where your question came from. But uh, I know. Pretty well. We've already, we already spent it in the last committee. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, my, I just missed That's fine. Any Sorry. further questions, um, Councillor Pentridge? What concerns me that um, being part of that um, heritage advisory, um, are we are we actually saying that because that money wasn't spent, it would therefore have lost it? Because what we were talking about um, there was incentives to try and get more people involved. Um, so what we're saying is that there's some left over in this year's budget. We're going to... So as we didn't spend 20000 That's correct. But that, we had 20000 to spend and it didn't happen, so we lost it. 
well, you didn't lose it. It means that the the, the work. This year. Mm. That's right. But, but what we are saying is that uh, we could have done the heritage. We could have done ten thousand mm. dollars more incentive that we didn't do because um, we weren't aware of it. But it does sound like it's going to be reflected in an enhanced program next year that you're already planning for and looking to rev up. And if we need an extra 10, we'll get it. <laughs> Any other questions, Councillor Pentridge? <laughs> Councillor Walker. Yes, you know, and similarly with the uh, cultural uh, strategy implementation, $10,000 has been moved from operational back into the um, the, the capital um, expenditure budget, um, consolidated revenue, I suppose you'd say, um, as chair of the cultural um, ad advisory board. I'm not sure if that money is directly related to that uh, committee or or whether it's part of the broader um, Launceston Council's um, cultural strategy implementation. But certainly it'd be a similar query, I suppose, as far as the Heritage Council goes, if that money is available um, somewhat by that committee um, to implement cultural strategy, I'd be most interested to having further discussion about that. Thank you. General Manager Dan, any insight you're able to provide? Yes, yeah, so some of that, I guess more broadly, it is aligned to the, the greater work we're doing in the cultural space, so it does tie in back into the Cultural Advisory Committee. Some of that would be for consultation work, uh, not just um, I guess uh, individual items, but it's how do we engage more broadly. There's a variety of projects that will come out of that. Um, I guess the work that we do with the advisory committee to uh, to find ways to spend that. But again, you're correct. Ten thousand dollars that hasn't been spent from that budget line. Any other contributions? Councillor Britton, do you wish to close? Let's put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. Thank you. We now move to 11.2, the King Billy Park lease. Uh, and we welcome up the back Michelle Gray, our lease and licensing officer. Someone to move the item, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you. Second up, Councillor Walker. Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to speak to the item? I think the item is actually 13.2, not 11.2. Um, look, I stand to endorse uh, the movement to do this. I note that it's overdue because I think it goes back to February, I think, or something was the date, uh, 1st of February. So it's being backdated. So again, we, I think we had an issue with this, so it's a bit late in getting to the table. The only other commentary as well, and I note the CEO has been given responsibility to talk to it, uh, to, 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 to do all the things necessary, certainly from uh, the Northern Suburbs Community Centre point of view. Um, I'll just sit down. I actually think I've got a conflict of interest here, so I best, I, I best walk down the <laughs> uh, uh, but, but the reality of it, I think there are some discussions that need to be held in relation to things that go on within the shed, but I probably shouldn't be talking about it, I just realise. <laughs> All right, so Councillor McKenzie, we might get you to withdraw from being the mover of the item. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll take that as a, um, yeah. So um, <laughs> who's going to move the item? Councillor Walker has moved the item. Seconded, uh, seconder is going to be Councillor Kai. Thank you. And um, you just heard from a speaker to the item, yeah. the chair of the Northern Suburbs Community Centre, uh, who was wearing a different hat. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mayor. I rise to um, uh, certainly begin by um, acknowledging the work that Councillor McKenzie does on the um, Northern Suburbs um, Community Centre Incorporated as chair of the um, incorporation. Um, he has worked tirelessly in the Northern Suburbs. Um, I certainly also rise uh, to congratulate the Council's support um, of this really uh, important and energising work that goes on at these various locations, including uh, this particular one in King Billy Park, well known as King Billy Park. Um, and um, certainly um, I rise to uh, support the ongoing uh, lease agreement. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walker. And of course, in all seriousness, there's no pecuniary interest 
there. Councillor McKenzie is a dedicated volunteer who takes on that role. Thank you. Councillor Kai as a seconder. Any contributions from councillors around the table? Okay, we'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 10-2. We welcome Councillor Mackenzie back at 2.15. 13.3, representation at the Australian Local Government Association's 2023 National General Assembly Conference. Um, look, just in terms of full disclosure, I thought it was appropriate to, uh, you know, have that listed there. Councillor Harris, as you are aware, has moved the motion, which was endorsed by the council, which has been received. Uh, it's appropriate for, in my view, Councillor Harris to speak to the motion. Uh, and so we've put them in together for full transparency. Someone to move the item. Councillor Dawkins, seconder. Councillor Walker. Councillor Dawkins, do you wish to speak to the motion? Um, just to say that it's important that we have a representation in these kind of fora um, and that we will be well represented by yourself and Councillor Harris. Councillor Walker. What I'm looking forward to is um, yourself, Mayor, and um, Councillor Harris bringing back that information regarding the key conference themes of building a stronger workforce, something that you know, councils around Australia are dealing with at the moment, the future of local government, something very timely mm -hmm. in Tasmania. Um, and many of the other things there that all councils around Australia would deal with. Um, and so, yeah, be most interested um, when we do get a report back from you. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Walker. And in saying that, we'll try and attend different streams as well to get best return. Yep. Councillor McMahon. I just wanted to clarify, it does say in the decision statement to consider the attendance of Mayor Danny Gibson and Councillor Alan Harris, but in the recommendation, it also lists, uh, actually, no, it doesn't. Did it previously have the Deputy Mayor listed as well? No, sorry. Disregard me. That being said, I should we should reiterate, as we did at the time when we sent it out, it's a great opportunity and great learning curve for any councillor to consider, um, you know, into the future putting up their hand. Obviously important, you know, for mayors, but significant learning opportunity for any councillor. And in the past, council has welcomed uh, expression of interest from councillors for future um, Australian local government conferences. Thank you, Councillor McMahon. Any other uh, questions or contributions? Deputy Mayor. Just quickly on that, I would have would have definitely loved to put my hand up if I wasn't having a baby. <laughs> Priorities. Not from both interests, yeah. Anything further? Councillor Dawkins, do you wish to close? Let's put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. 13.4, intention to close part of South Esk Road. We welcome Acting Manager of Governance um, and author of the report, Duncan Campbell. There are no speakers to the item. Someone to move. Councillor McKenzie has moved the item. Seconder, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Councillor McKenzie. I'll start by saying I rather hope this is the last time I actually have to speak about this particular topic. Mm -hmm. We've had it uh, ongoing, I think, in the notes it talks about 1993 or 2003, a long time anyway, mm -hmm. that this particular matter has been, uh, uh, been before us. And we've obviously got two items to deal with, one here and one in closed council in relation to uh, 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 confidential matters. Uh, I guess my only concern in relation to it, I thought we'd got to the stage where we just now did it. Um, it sounds like we have to go through another round of advertising again, which is a bit disturbing on the basis of the last round of advertising, which we thought was going to be fairly innocuous, turned into about a 10, 10 or 15 year court case. Mm -hmm. um, so I just hope that this is a bit more perfunctory than that. I might just ask that question at the end of this. But I think it's uh, a matter that wasn't brought about by council. It was brought about by an individual who actually encroached on our, our, our public open space. So it's not a, a council caused issue. It's been caused by, uh, by a resident who took up too much land. Um, in relation to the amount of land and its impact, it's 
you know, it's it's not a great impact on us. And I think that, again, without setting precedents, which I know we've talked about this particularly in around the gorge, I think we might have had a similar slither somewhere else where we've approved in the past. Uh, the issues that emanated out of public highway issues and a number of other things that went way above my pay grade in relation to why they had to uh, be put through the, the, the courts and so forth, but they went there and then they came out. And I thought we were in a position now where we can just deal with the matter, but it seemed like we'd have to do another advertising process. So um, I'm fully supportive of us moving forward and resolving this matter with the landowner uh, because I think there's a very minor uh, impact on the community in relation to it and whether previously they thought that we were selling them the lane, I don't know, but uh, that may well have been the case. But it's very clearly it's only a little small put in on the edge of the lane and the, the lane that goes down the hill will remain and will still be available for the use of the community to uh, traverse up and down that steps if you're a really keen uh, exercise person like me and run up and down those things regularly, um, it's fantastic. So I guess I'd just ask you, Duncan, just to explain the actual legal process that we've still got to go through because it looks like we've got some more advertising that needs to happen. Thanks, Councillor McKenzie. Duncan, further unpacking point two of the motion and section 14, etc. The other one. Thank you for the question. Um, so just to clarify, this is the land in South Esk Road, not the laneway. Um, so the, the processes involved with the closure of South Esk Road were not completed when they started back in 2004. So we need to start that process afresh um, so that we can make sure all the requirements of Section 14 occur. If no objections are received, then Council will be free under the authority of this decision to close that part of the road. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Duncan. Second up, Deputy Mayor. Question, Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mayor. Is there currently any, um, through you, if I may, Mayor, uh, encroachment upon uh, this section of um, South Bank um, by any dwellings? There's no, is there? There's a concrete wall, okay. yeah, and some garden yep. space. And um, the closing of this section of the road it would make South Esk Road um, narrow than, narrower than 20 metres in that section? <clears throat> um, that's, it's not relevant. Um, yeah, it, it's not relevant that the carriageway is narrowed. So I think what you're getting at is um, the restrictions that existed back in the 1800s, which were to do with the dimensions of the road, but those are no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. Um, no, no, certainly no longer applicable. So then, um, what is the main motivation for us today seeking to close this road, close this section of the road? Is it only at the request of um, a landowner or is there also uh, some uh, tangible sort of outcome for the council? This has been a very long running dispute. Um, and it's a pragmatic approach to bring a matter to a close. Um, the professional advice from the um, road engineers is that the land is very unlikely to be needed for future use. Um, so it's about bringing a long running matter to a close. Thank you, Duncan. Any further questions, Councillor Walker? Any further speakers? The seconder doesn't wish to speak. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council Officers, for the work that they've put into this over the last 20 years. And, um, you know, thank you to the uh, 200 years of um, antiquated law in Tasmania that has brought us to this position. Look, certainly I can understand uh, the consternation and frustration that landowners might have in certain situations around our city uh, where boundaries don't seem to ma match uh, their expectations or perhaps, um, you know, they would uh, covet a piece of land that might be um, not on their title, uh, but that they have use for, that's completely understandable. Um, but it's also um, understandable that Launceston Council may wish uh, to draw a line in the sand, so to speak, or in this case, in the soil, um, uh, to protect the amenity, uh, and, the, and I know this is not public land, but uh, in, in a common sense, the public land uh, that we manage on behalf of the citizens of Launceston. In this case, it has um, you know, certain um, complexities. We're dealing with um, historical 
events that weren't in, um, in the control of the landowner. They bought into this situation. I can appreciate that. It doesn't necessarily mean that Launceston Council uh, should um, roll over um, and allow uh, people to, to, you know, usurp uh, those pieces of land that they may desire, or indeed they may be currently using. I mean, it is a you know common legal term, the caveat emptor, is buy beware. Have a look at what you're buying, have an understanding of what you're buying, and know full well that you may have to resolve issues that, that haven't been resolved uh, before you came along. In this situation, um, this resolution, although it is not associated directly with the laneway, except for the very small amount of land at the top of the laneway, yeah, in front of the laneway, um, probably half a square metre or something like that, it certainly relates to this ongoing dispute that Council's had to deal with. And I think that Council has acted um, in, in, in all honesty and fairness in the situation. I don't think uh, um, that, you know, Council has been irresponsible in the process. The very sad thing in any of these legal cases, of course, it is that it costs a lot of money. Um, and it might seem at a certain point that people weigh that up and say, well, the amount of money involved is not worth it compared to the amount of land involved. But it is very important for Launceston Council uh, to maintain that principle and to maintain uh, its sovereignty over the land that it does uh, hold on behalf of the people of Launceston. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Are there any other contributions? Okay, Councillor McKenzie, do you wish to close? Um, <clears throat> only that I hope we all vote in favour of this because uh, it, it needs to be dealt with. And um, whilst I, I think precedent's uh, something that we've always been conscious of, and I think we've had three in the last year where we've dealt with encroachments on the gorge, uh, one of them is not dissimilar to the one that we have, which we passed through, and one was basically a backyard was sort of, you know, in, going into the gorge, which we actually didn't, uh, didn't pass, I think, in the end. So... I think that um, I take the view that pragmatism in this particular case where there is no detriment to the, the citizens of Launceston by doing it, I think is probably the best approach to deal with it. Um, and the uh, person who owns the property at the moment may or may not have known about that encroachment before they purchased it. But, uh, but regardless of that, I think we need to get to a conclusion on this and move on with our lives, uh, as I don't think we'll have any significant impact on the residents of Launceston. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. Those against? Three councillors are against in Councillors Walker, Pentridge and Kai. Three, eight. Therefore, the motion is carried. And the uh, happy with that? Yep. Thank you. Let's move to item 14, Chief Executive Officer Network 14.1, the Northern Tasmania Cricket Association Precinct Charter. It's recommended that the Council endorses the NTCA multi-purpose, sorry, multi-sports precinct facilities management group charter as included. Someone to move the item? Councillor Britton has moved the item. Seconder, Councillor Palmer. Councillor Britton, would you like to speak or reserve your right at the stage? No, I'll, I'll speak. That's fine. <laughs> um, no, no, I, I, I think I think it's a brilliant idea. We had a workshop the other day that went through our uh, the importance of sporting grounds um, and the need to, to maintain them and keep them keep them going well. And this is all, all seems to be a move in the right direction. So I'll be voting in support of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Britton. Seconder, Councillor Palmer. Any councillor wish to speak to this item? Councillor Walker has a question. Thank you, Mayor. Through you, I'll just ask if the CEO could um, outline the, the main changes that this group charter uh, will bring in, in bringing the different um, precinct users together under this charter? Thanks. Um, CO. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. It's a good question. So at the moment, um, all responsibility 
and, and large part of the work involved in the management of the precinct falls to the NTCA committee. Um, and they do a good work, volunteers, all of them. Um, and obviously they have paid staff that, that deliver that. So what this does is the main change is, is um, incorporates the, the, um, the tenants to have a role um, in, and to pick up some of the workload in respect of the, the planning and the um, understanding of maintenance and the, um, um, the direction, if you like, of the staff that are engaged by the NTCA. It certainly doesn't undermine or diminish the role of the NTCA. They've done a great job um, with limited resources and a difficult task. Um, this will um, spread the load, if you like, um, and allow for greater input from all of those that, that you know, benefit from the, the facility. Thanks, CEO. Thanks for the question, Councillor Walker. Any other contributions? Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mayor. I will note the, uh, the work that um, our CEO does in this area in um, his role as, I do believe, um, uh, part of the board? No? On the NTCA? No? I'll, I will... Loyal servant. Phrase. What's that? Servant of the council. Yes, yeah, servant of the council, nonetheless, but as certainly our main um, liaison, I suppose, then you would say, with uh, the NTCA ground um, and ongoing sort of negotiations in that regard. Um, it's certainly an important precinct for Launceston, um, something that it, it's, its role you know, has slowly changed and hopefully with um, you know, specific investment um, over the next few years, that, that role will change further. Um, but yes, I was under the impression that the CEO attended the meetings, but it must be the case that um, that was in. I, I won't ask the question there. I'll, I'll just leave it there. I know that he's certainly done a fair bit of work in the area. We'll leave it at that. Um, but certainly an important uh, facility for Launceston. And um, you can only imagine that it will become uh, more and more crucial over time with um, the amount of sports, uh, the growth in the, in the various sports involved. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Deputy Mayor, I wonder if you could take the chair for a moment. Thank you, Mayor. Would you like to speak? I would. Thank you. Uh, look, I just want to say that I think this is a wonderful result for the number of tenants that uh, utilise that particular facility. Uh, certainly in my early days, there was lots of conflict and there were lots of challenges that had to be, uh, had to be determined with regard to the governance and the governance arrangements uh, pertaining to that site. I think now we're in the best position ever in terms of the way that different tenants and user groups are working collaboratively. You'll note, of course, that one of the tasks is now to develop the precinct um, plan, which I think will be a real blueprint for some of our other facilities as well. I note that uh, a number of um, the tenants and users are certainly the, the most happy they've been. And as the CEO said, it in no way reflects the governance model, but it just shows the way that sports and, and facilities evolve. Um, and this governance review is the first of its kind in 30 years. It's well welcomed by all of the tenants, by the NTCA themselves and by other users. And as I say, I think it will be uh, a great beginning for us to be able to apply to other important sports facilities like St Leonard's into the future. Thank you, Mayor. Handing the meeting back to you. Thanks, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Britton, do you wish to close? Let's put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. Council, uh, those against, those abstaining. Councillor McKenzie is abstaining, therefore the motion is carried 10-1. Thank you. So a motion now in item 15, page 71 of the agenda to move into closed council for the reasons set out. Someone to move. Thank you, Councillor Walker. A seconder. Councillor Britton, thank you. Okay, we'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour, raise their hand. That is all councillors. Therefore, the motion is carried 11-0. We'll now move into closed council and go off air. Thank you.
And we are now in open council at 2.57. Someone to move that council considers the items. Thank you. Move to Councillor Kai and seconded Councillor Britton. All those councillors in favour raise their hand. That is all councillors present. The motion is carried 11-0. We will officially close the meeting at 2.57. Thanks so much.